Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Tony Pritchard. Welcome, Tony. Thanks very much and uh, good to be here. It's great for you to be here. So tell us about you and your work. Okay, what I'll probably do is I'll, I'll start um, more recent and just say um, what, what I was doing recently and then maybe jump back to a key some key formative influences uh, up until now. So um, mm -hmm. I was I, I ran two courses at the London College of Communication, which was London College of Printing. And the course was um, a part-time postgraduate certificate, a full-time postgraduate diploma called Design for Visual Communication. And it was largely for mature uh, postgraduate, they were graduate in a different subject, not graphic design. So, you know, speech therapist, lawyer, all these sorts of things. And for some reason, there was a journey towards our course um, set up in 2004 in response to the MA, which was then being run by Ian Noble and Russell Bestley. And they were getting interesting people that weren't quite right for the MA. So, they needed a almost like a foundation, postgraduate foundation course. Um, for students to get up to speed on research methods and the practicalities of the subject. But also we had short courses and they, students, people that had studied on those short courses wanted something more substantial that might be a qualification. So that was set up to meet that requirement. And so that's, that's what I did between 2004 and uh, 2020 when I decided to, that I, I wanted to embark on a different phase of life. Um, but just to step back and just a few key points that, that maybe led up to that course, which I've been most associated with, um, just jumping way back um, to, you know, how did I get into this subject and, and education? Um, right back, you know, when I was six years old, we were living in Scotland and there was a project, a Nature Prize project, which I made a, a book which you know, I stuck flowers in and cut out animals and stuck that in. It might have been competitive dad because my father probably did it. So probably my father probably won the prize. But I became aware of this sort of visualisation thing. Um, and then when I went to primary school um, in Kent, where I am now, uh, there was a really nice teacher called Mr Howard. And he was, he was very reminiscent of, there was a programme called... Uh, out of town and there was a, a, the present of that was like an, a wise old man that could do things and that was what that teacher was like and we actually made a book which was stitched an actual book uh, on at a primary school level so I thought that was pretty amazing and I think I designed the um, sports day cover so I was kind of getting into uh, for some reason into this thing it was interested me I've got an older sister that I was also into art and she had books on a shelf. Like I remember one uh, by Goya, and almost like it was nightmarish. You know, Satan devours his children, or Guernica, and 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 just the 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 nightmarishness. It was a very strong visual thing. I was seemingly drawn to the visual, and um, just watching films like Jason and the Argonauts, where the skeletons rise up out of the sand. I had nightmares. So I think I had a very vivid imagination from quite early on. Um, just then jumping over the main school, um, foundation course was absolutely fundamental. It was so important. It was, I look back 40 years ago and I just feel it, it was one of the most enjoyable, important years of my life. And I think people talk about national service, but I, I think any school child leaving school um, would benefit from a year of eclecticism. I worked really hard at school, but it just didn't work for me. I didn't, I just, I managed to grab a few O-levels qualifications to get myself onto foundation. And then once I got on foundation, that was it. It just, and it, and it was a real booster. At the interview, the person said, you're the next David Hockney. I went, what? You know, I thought, what? So, but it was the complementary studies. We did psychology, philosophy, music, history of art, history of design. 
and it was eclectic and that might be something we return to like is something missing from education just this sort of opening your mind that we watched a razor head by david lynch you thought what you know when you're at school you're not really you're doing things in a particular way but here it was like open so so um all that eclecticism of listening to abba hendrix stockhausen other people's tastes you know everyone could have an individual voice and a taste and um that was hugely i think influential a year to find out maybe where you're going i thought i was going to be an illustrator because again the influences during the 1970s would be book covers record sleeves you know i used to copy the logos of roger dean for example uh, i just emulate learn in that sort of way um so that was really important i went to do my ba undergraduate at middlesex polytechnic it's a university now and um the person that interviewed i didn't know until much later on who that person really was i just thought he was an old man i i was dressed like rick mail from the young ones like a rebel you know old person <laughs> And so it was Romick Marber. Romick Marber interviewed me, and he's an amazing um, person. And he, he, but he didn't, he, he he didn't radiate that. He radiated humbleness, which might be a bit of advice for later on. Is mm. look at look at some people like Romick Marber. So humble. Um, what he went through in his early life was just unbelievable. Um, if you want to talk more on that, we can. So he interviewed me, and I was offered a place. Uh, so I was really grateful. Middlesex was a lovely building. I chose it for the building. I knew nothing, you know. Well, I wasn't really in a great position to be making sorts of choices about my life at that point. Um, foundation did help. But I thought I was going to be doing illustration, but I gradually moved more towards um, typography. Like my illustration was taking longer and longer and longer, and it wasn't becoming, it wasn't that fashionable. Um, and I suddenly picked up on this typography thing in my last year. So people like Romick Marber, Sid Day, Andrew Haig, who worked at Kinnear Calvert, Peter Gill, they became more influential. They were saying, your typography is architectural. Oh, what's that? I don't know. What... I knew nothing, which probably helped, but I didn't know sort of so much. Um, so I did that. And um, at the end, when I felt like the carp had come from underneath you and you just didn't know what to do next after you left college. It, it, college had been my life uh, and I really enjoyed it. You know, there are ups and downs, there always are, but overall it was really good. But a couple of weeks later, Peter Gill, my tutor, who I'd worked very closely with, that's another thing that I learned was, and maybe we talked about this somewhere else, I think probably online somewhere. Um, in the first year, there's lots of tutors and all there was back. And I, I had a grant yeah. Because my mum and dad had split, so we couldn't afford for me to do foundation and a BA. But I had a grant to go and study. Um, and there were lots of tutors, but because it wasn't um, priced up in the way it is now, you didn't really, you weren't looking for value for money or anything like that. You were just there all the time throughout the week, and there were different things going on each day. Um, but by the time I got to the final year, I'd worked out having spoken to a lot of tutors. There was great tutors, someone called Bush Hollyhead, great illustrator. But he was loads of ideas, you know, a million ideas per minute. And he was scribbling. I still got scribbles all over my note, over my sketchbook. And then Peter was more, let's just do the one thing. Let's spend a long time looking at the one thing. So I really appreciated the input, but I kind of in the end got to work with Peter, uh, who then asked me to, go and work in his studio. So that was my transition from being a student within education to the workplace. And I saw immediately, Andrew Haig was also in the studio. So you had two tutors in a graphic design studio that were also in education. So that, that idea became rooted pretty quickly of, of how one can feed the other. Um, and I really liked that as an idea. Uh, so, um, yeah, I went to work with, with, with Peter and I, again, I hadn't really developed who I was as a designer because I came to typography and graphic design 
quite late thinking that I would be an illustrator. I remember Muller Brutton said, reflected on himself and said, the world doesn't need another mediocre illustrator because I think that's what he was going to do. And I probably felt the same, um, that um, I loved the idea of it. You know, the Radio Times had been in the family home, so it was another input. And Radio Times back in the 70s had wonderful cover illustrations and illustrations yeah. inside. Absolutely. And it really informed you. It was actually a lot of information design type illustration as well, like the landing on the moon. It was. It doesn't feel that. It seems that celebrity culture took over, and that's what you see in these magazines. But during the seventies, um, Mike Dempsey's written a great piece on his blog, uh, uh, just showing you know the early days, Eric Fraser, and then Peter Brooks, and people like that, illustrated. So when I saw that, I thought that would be an influence. That'd be that's what I want to do. But of course, the Radio Times would expect you to do an illustration quickly, you know, not months. So I realised that wasn't, and, and, and the typography and graphic design was becoming a uh, more of a thing for me. So I was developing, really, maybe the education began when I joined the, the, the studio and there were more books there and it wasn't, it was pre-computer. So there was um, like a dark room with a photomechanical transfer machine, lecture set, you know, ordering various materials doing artwork. I was really glad that they trusted me to do the artwork. And I just loved it. I wasn't like, I need to design record sleeves, although that was would have been an influence. My first job, I think, was designing a lanyard for Star Computer Company. Oh, wow. You know, even though it's that small, I got a bit of type, I got a logo, I got some colours. Just to produce something felt amazing. You know, my, my college projects were a redesign of the pro and then the identity for Reba, Royal Institute for the, what is it, Reba, British Architects? Um, uh, British Architects, yes. Yeah, do, uh, doing an identity because that had six different departments. So how do you do an identity for uh, one thing that has six different things? And that actually re came back in a project we, I did with Peter um, called London Research Centre that had four departments. So how do you accommodate the whole, but do the individual parts. Um, so Andrew was more socially driven. So in the studio, Andrew was um, more politics, charities, that sort of thing. I did some work with Andrew later. Uh, Peter, uh, they were both, had a slightly a hippie aspect to it. The studio had that aspect to it. Um, but with Peter, it was what came along. It was actually financial work, quite a lot of financial work, annual reports, information design, things like that. Um, so I think that kind of, well, I, I, you might want to, maybe we talk about um, how I got into education because that seemed kind of a natural thing. Is that okay to go maybe that route? Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that's, you, you seem to be answering many questions, which is fantastic. Yes, right. go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So, so maybe transitioning from, you know, I, I had that sort of upbringing, went through an education process myself and then transitioned into the, you know, a practical, pra the practice of graphic design, uh, which eventually, you know, became more uh, Apple Macs and software and things like that, which we can, we can go back to, to that development. Um, but uh, Andrew Haig um, was becoming more successful in the studio and couldn't keep his one day teaching at Middlesex. So he suggested that I might be interested. So I, that's what I did. That's when I, I first went back one day. And it was great because actually technology was developing. I mean, Middlesex had worked with the BBC. They'd got the Contel machines in. So they, they'd already adopted. And I think someone called Dr. John Vince was at Bounds Green. And he, he was doing the early TV graphics, like news, the one for Newsnight, where the world's spinning around in a, and then it unwraps and... So I think Middlesex had adopted like a, a relationship to technology. So that was useful for me to be in that situation, working with, with people that were maybe two years younger than me. Um, so we, we were discovering these things together as well as still investing in fundamental principles such as typographic hierarchy, structure, colour, form, these sorts of things. 
So that was, again, an education to me to go back into that situation, take stuff from the studio into that, that environment, but also to learn from what their ambitions, the people that I was working with, what their ambitions were. So I really enjoyed that as a start. Um, then one night, Peter said, we, we went to various um, private view degree shows. We went we went to the Royal College where there was, uh, um, I think, was it did Phil Baines? I think Andy Altman and Why Not Associates. Maybe Jonathan Barnbrook was there. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. Or Phil Baines. It was that era of next wave type book, which I wasn't particularly into because I was working with people from a previous generation. I think they were still open to the idea of new things were happening. Uh, but we went to London College of Printing and and we had got, Peter got some work from a guy called Martin Ashley who was teaching there. A lot of people might know Martin. He was interviewed by Tom Eckersley, 1972, for his role, job at college. And you know, Tom Eckersley set the department up there. It had a lot of history, Anthony Frosch, how... I really liked the idea of the place. So we went to a private view for media and production design course, which was a second graphic design course, which with the CNAA who validated the course, they had to have a different course than the BA graphic design course. So they had to have some production and also connected to industry. And Henrian, FHK Henrian, was behind that. You know, he thought, well, I've been in industry and I think it'd be useful for students to maybe have a placement part a year out into industry. So that was a distinctive feature of the course. I saw the course. It was really different from any other graphic design course. It wasn't trying to be the next rock star. Students were doing projects like Bill Bickerstaff, who's at OPX, and Francis Jackson, and Simon Goodall. Oh, God, thank goodness. I, remember. I know David Bent's there as well. But I, that was my first year that I was teaching. That was the year that I was teaching. And Helen Keyes was there a few years before and Robin Richmond, who helped set up Meta Design. So it was a real place I was very interested in. And I said to Martin, you know, like Bill Bickstaff had done this project where he was looking at injections, what are called vials, which have small type, very long chemical terms and mistakes were being made because the two ends of the name were generic. The specific was in the middle. So it's like four-point typography, which you can't really read in an emergency. So Bill, yeah. that was his final project. He said, well, how can typography help with that situation? So he was looking at condensed type for the two end bits, but expanded type for the middle bit. I just thought, that's a different kind of undergraduate student project. That sounded more like a PhD to me. Yeah. Um, so that was the kind of work. And I, I really, and Pete, Brian Grimley, Anthony Froshow had taught on the course as well. So I thought that I really like this as an idea to, to work with students that were interested in those sorts of things, in really information design and stuff like that. Uh, and it, the history of typography and information design at LCP really attracted me. So I said to Martin, this is amazing. I love this stuff. And he said, come with me. He introduced me to someone called Peter Pierce, who's the course leader of MPD. And I, um, I sort of repeated that, that I said, I really liked it. And so he said, come down with your portfolio. Let's talk and see whether you can input here. So it was easy as that. There wasn't really an interview process as such. Um, that's I was, but it was very precarious. You know, I, I lost my two of the two visiting lectures uh, very, you know, at, at both Middlesex and LCP because it was precarious. You know, one minute you're in, one minute you're not, you're, you're out again. Um, so that was my introduction to LCP. And... Uh, there really weren't jobs because someone had to die for a job to become available. There wasn't really that development. So, yeah, so I went to, again, work. That's how I had the connection to the LCP. Middlesex stopped. At one point, LCP stopped because they went from a transition from media and production design and the graphic design course became one course, which is the current graphic and media design so the name of graphic and media design comes from media from mpd and graphic from graphic design so they made one big course again so i, I was a bit xlcp at that point uh, but then i came back because i needed help with the placement year like sarah temple hadn't taken that on i think there have been various people like annie eves um but it was running into a bit of a problem area because of the creativity type thing of of the 1980s of like hey do what you want everything's 
that the industry became a little bit nervous and they said, what's happened at the LCP? So I think at that point, Mike Evans was the original course leader. He had moved on. The quality assurance agency, QAA, was coming in for an inspection and the culture of colleges was like, okay, try not to uh, say too much, but it was more relaxed. Like people might go down the pub at lunchtime. You know, certain people were known to drink and that may be you know, certain students like Helen Keys and I've forgotten her name. She was the ICA publicity, Jane Harper mentioned that you might have to go down the pub for a tutorial. It was a little more relaxed. So when the inspection agency was coming in, big change was needed. And that came in the form of uh, a new dean, uh, Liz Leyland, who's fantastic, I have to say, and uh, Ian Noble and Russ Bessler, who brought in a huge change in terms of visual research, really changed the, the idea that actually research could be the product. This was something at universities, other subjects had understood that you can just present research and, and that can be visualized and that can be the product. The research is the product, you know, so that was their thing. That's what they brought in. And so Liz had to change the culture from um, you know, going down the pub and drinking uh, 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 and, and more, you've got to be on site. You know, we're going to be inspected. We need to modernize because it, it, it was old culture. Um, so, yeah, I thought, Ian, it, I was young enough to accept that there was a change happening and and, and it was important. And uh, I was on the information pathway and we were doing very worthy projects, very small. And people have commented about it. it's very small and it's very worthy. At that point, I, and Martin had gone on sabbatical. I took on temporary looking after the pathway and we brought in jobs started to be able to happen. So we, we brought in, David Phillips came in, and then Hamish Muir came in. Uh, and so things began to develop. And we had a conversation, again, with Martin, that things needed to change on the pathway. And adopting Russ and Ian's idea that the research could be the product, um, we began to write projects more that were looser. And I worked with someone called Zara Moore. And her project, she said, I'm working in a chemist in a pharmacist to earn money to pay for my education she said i noticed that every time someone asks for something we look for it as if it's the first time there doesn't seem to be any color coding typographic coding packaging and so she made she made that investigation of packaging color typography just as the research into that so it didn't have to become a something. It didn't, she didn't say, I'm now going to redesign packages. She produced a series of posters that revealed her, her investigation. Another student did um, visualize the, and I think this is the, I think it's an early missing stage of data visualization because it'd been late 1990s and um, early 2000. And the project, that the student did was to visualize five years of World War Two, which um, all air battles, land battles, sea battles, and so and we and the new media block had just been built, but hadn't been hab inhabited and it hadn't been split down into rooms. So you had this amazing exhibition space. So you had this really large, colorful installation that from a distance, you thought, oh, that's a lovely bit of like Frank Stella's work. You thought, that's a lovely bit of fine art. But as you became closer, there was small type that informed you what the colours meant. So closer, it was high, very, very poignant. Um, so I, we made a change in terms of how information design was going to develop. And then the opportunity came on a course that I then became more associated with. So I kind of left the information design pathway. I did, before Jamie Hobson came as course leader, the next course leader of, uh, after Ian and Russ moved to the MA to develop that. And really, I think Russ would say that their, the MA that they started and was like a research project in itself and became the visual research book, which is an amazing achievement, I think, for Russ and Ian and the last edition with, with Paul McNeil. 
uh, it's an amazing achievement. It's so influential. Um, so yeah, I moved. I moved away from information. I, I did do temporary the graphic media design course, which I pro by not getting the job. So sometimes not getting the job is a blessing in disguise. It, it was a tough. It would have been a tough job, and Jamie was more uh, experienced than me. It gone through its validation. It, it did really, it, uh, and it did really well at the QAA. It, 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 that was really tense. That time was very tense to get that through, but it was very successful. Um, and two thousand and three, four, this this new course for mature learners came up. I didn't realise I was the course lead. I was actually in the validation, sandwiched between Russ and Ian, and I was thinking, oh, this, I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't write the handbook. I inherited it. I said, this is an interesting course because my job at that point, my first full time job was head of curriculum development uh, and head of you know the subject development curriculum development and quality i'd been that's what I, I, I when i didn't get the job for gmd there was this other job which i got so it was the first i was coming up to 40 and I, I suddenly realized that my freelance graphic design self employed wasn't really working i it, i wasn't picking things weren't developing but education was developing. I, I and I said to Ian, I, I want a job. <laughs> and he said, Okay, that's a clear statement of intent. And they tried to find something, but nothing really fitted. And I, I contacted contacted Liz because she was accessible. You know, I rang up and got the dean and, and I said, I want a job. She said, Well, we're, we're not really planning for anything. So I said, Well, I see there's something at Kingston, I'll go for that. An hour later, in fairness to her, she'd been to see the head of college, said, We're going to set some temporary things up. And you can be interviewed for that, but a year later we'll have to interview it for real. Anyway, so I got that, and I, I was stepping up gradually. And so eventually, I, I was sitting at a validation, going, "This is an interesting course. Who's the course leader?" And like people looked at me. <laughs> I think the dean said, "Well, you're like, you know, you're without portfolio. You, yeah, you're in a job, but we think it would be really good if you actually had a course." Um, so the, the then Dean Mike Bradshaw was quite influential as well in ideas in developing that course and actually mentoring me into other things like being on the university um, assessment working party, developing assessment uh, guidelines and learning outcomes and all of these sorts of things. So it was, it was a lot of fun for a while being in that position. And then I kind of got, got this course uh, we developed it part time first of all, and we didn't really realise what we had until maybe the third year, and that's when the curriculum really developed. It was a bit experimental in the early days, and as it was small, I didn't have much visiting lecture money or, or even course money, so I had to beg, borrow, and steal. But it was it had a, a, it was very eclectic. Like I think Teal was at college, and she offered to do something on politics and design. Tory Dunn, I mm. met, again, the way that you can develop a course going back was Liz Leyland told Martin and I, get a taxi and go and visit places. And so that was, that was kind of a research in itself, we'll go and visit some places. So we went to the Science Museum and, and met Tim Malloy. It was actually Tim Malloy that called my course a foundation, a postgraduate foundation course. So we met Tim Malloy at the Science Museum, and that was interesting because we were going to do exhibition design. And he said, I don't like using exhibition designers. I like using graphic designers because they can visualise things. He talked about Michael Johnson when he said there's a problem getting people past the Edwardian facade of the Science Museum. What can we do? Over lunch, they had chatted. And then I think Michael Johnson got a spark from a Psy, uh, you know, Psy Museum like that, whereas a... a a 3D designer might build a model. So Tim Malloy was kind of really open to graphic design. And he said, go to Hollington Interactive and meet Tori Dunn, because she's a creative thinker. She was his go-to person. And Tori was very different from me and Martin at, at LCP. If you were to type up, it was eight point type and typographic hierarchy. And she was more like, um, what are we gonna do about the missing sock? You know, when you wash, and you, you, where's that sock gone? What are we going to do about the missing sock? What are we going to do about the cues in the canteen? So she was a creative thinker, and Tory was politics and design. Darren Raven, I think we, we had a little chat with the other day uh, on Facebook. 
Darren um, yeah. did narrative transitions, Scott McLeod's idea of narrative transitions. It was eclectic because I needed to borrow people because I couldn't, I hadn't developed what the course really was in terms of the curriculum. So we had more input and we about by the third year, people like Cam Rehow, who's now, I think, he's been course leader at Greenwich and I think he's now at Camberwell. Because you were dealing with grown-ups, which kept you on your feet, it really, you know, kept you on your feet because they were, they had worked professionally. So you couldn't muck around with them, not that you should do. So they were helping develop the curriculum. They said, well, why aren't we doing anything with visual language? There was a, a book, Christian LeBorg's book on visual grammar had just come out. So I went, okay, let's, let's do something around that. And so that really developed by the student feeding back on those sorts of things. So the input from people like Darren, Tory, Teal, Jeff Haddon, great. And he, he developed the reductive drawing aspect of, of, of the course. And another Jeff, Jeff White, really influential on me. I just, Jeff could hypothesize, he could draw um, lots of ideas together and then say, this might be nonsense, but I've, I've found out this. Uh, so he helped with visual language. He also helped with typography. Jeff was well known for his work at Ravensbourne. Um, and he was a lovely person. I thought he was going to be a nightmare because Ravensbourne seemed to be quite strict back in the 70s and the 80s. They seemed quite strict with their attitude. They're, you know, they're developing more of a Bauhaus to steal Russian constructivism and that you, you bought into that approach. But Jeff wasn't like that. He was very, again, very eclectic, very absorbing and kept developing himself you know even into his 90s he was still looking and developing learning learning from the students he was so when he'd like to chat to the students and learn about them and their culture and where they came from and their ideas and it all fed into his ideas of one example would be repetition in design so he would say if you look at the painting of Surah, the bather the angle the curve here is reflected in the bank so he said and then he saw Malevich he said do you see that angle is reflected here so his idea that often in design things are reflected something repeats itself is important and he looked at typography and different types of layout so he would say there's the clustered layout or the group layout or the staggered layout and this was him just hypothesizing and then showing it to the students so we had Jeff White as well so I was amazed just looking back at that, you know, we, we had 20 hours of VT, so it was nothing at all. So it was like five hours of Jeff Haddon, 10 hours of Jeff White, you know, piecing things together. Uh, but it helped to develop that course. Like Tory Dunn said to me, your course, your students need to be saved from you. Because if it, if it had just been me and my eight point type, <laughs> it would have been not right you know um but eventually the course developed uh, and we got this this curriculum around typography and visual language and information design we developed like in the first term quite a structured approach to fundamental principles put those in and then students can use them individually um to do to develop their voice and their interest another thing that russ would say they would be quite harsh like he described Ian himself as bad cop, worse cop. You know, that they're going to be very critical. They're going to be questioning. Uh, and they questioned the question. You know, so if you had a research question, that would become questioned. And so, again, that was quite influential on... Um, they, didn't, they weren't necessarily interested in your subject. They were interested in your method, your method of investigation and research. And so we took that we took that on board in terms of uh, the course. I don't think we were as harsh as that, but once students had the fundamental principles, they could develop projects that maybe they had come on the course for. You know, we had a speech therapist who said that when people have brain damage and they're they're recovering, the 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 visual the visual is very important, but the visual material isn't good. So she came that so the. People that come on the course have to have a purpose. They, they wouldn't get on the course and they're, 
on the portfolio, often the portfolio coming in wasn't that great. But if the intention was really good, we could take a risk, a joint risk about coming on board and developing projects. Um, and so, yeah, the the professor of law from Kent University, I thought, well, what do you, why didn't you just employ a designer? Now, she, she reckoned that law is a complex area and, the, and visual communication would really help. And when she came on board, she was like, you guys don't realize what you've got. Our methods aren't the methods of other subjects. So the idea of critique wasn't really in in the law school where she came from. So she, I mean, I think Russ and Ian's visual research book is on the is one of the reading lists of uh, her PhD model in law school. And so you thought, hold on, we've got something that other people want that we maybe undervalue. You know, people from the profession wanted to take visual communication skills back into their existing job. They didn't want to necessarily become a graphic designer. They wanted what visual communication had. They realized there was something of value that they wanted. Um, and that became a bit of a theme on the course. It, you know, some people might just realize they're not interested in becoming a graphic designer and doing that in a studio. They, they want it for personal reasons. They want to develop themselves. Um, so the course developed its purpose. But basically, we, we had to select people on who they were and what they wanted and what they were going to bring. Uh, and that was lovely, you know, because um, you were collaborating with them on their idea. that You had something they wanted, so you could give them something. Um, so that was really interesting. Another aspect, I think, of education that's important is it's not when things go well. It's when things go wrong and you're tested and there's a struggle. And that, that mm, I learned the, quite a, yeah. a lot of, from working with students. It, it's incredibly frustrating and everyone wants to give up. And the one particular case was Yale. The first part, the first part of the course where you're picking up the fundamental principles, that's fun and it, it's relatively easy to do. There's, project, there's loose projects associated with it, so you can take it in whatever direction you wanted. But the real problem is when you've got freedom, when you finally have your creative freedom, but you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to get the research question or statement of te intent focused is really difficult. And this one, the project the student was working on was for a children's charity that needed volunteers. And um, um, and it wasn't working. And she had, we had a conversation. She said, "Can I leave the course now? Do, do I get do I get a certificate if I leave?" I said, "Don't leave. We've got to work through this. This is this is the learning point. This is we all want to make a lovely, beautiful end project, but this is where you're going to really learn when you struggle and it's not coming together. And yeah, we all have absolutely. to learn that. And, and maybe I'll talk about some of my projects where it's the same thing." So what well, she'd done the Absolutely. symbol, she'd done the symbol, she'd done the illustration, she'd done the logo, nothing was working. So we said, oh, go to letterpress. She liked letterpress. Go and set the title in letterpress. And um, she came back and there was a, we were a round table discuss it with other people. And the thing with large woodblock letters is there's, there's often not enough, particularly say the letter E. So she'd set, and the charity's name is really long. So there were, the name was there, it was still readable, but letters were missing. And people said, why, why are the letters missing? And, and she was getting more and more frustrated. said, because that's letterpress. We haven't got all the letters. And Cam Rehow was around the table and I was there. And we looked at each other and we thought, that's the idea. The idea isn't in front of you. The idea is here. You can't see the idea. And because it was a charity yeah. that you volunteered from, then maybe you could be the missing letter or in typography, you're the missing character. It seemed to communicate the idea of they need things filled and maybe you could be the, and I think Yale took a look at us and said, for real? Really? That seems like a crazy idea, but it's not, often the idea isn't here. The idea you can't Absolutely. see. It's a frustrating, frustrating thing. Um, so Absolutely. I thought so, that was, so you've seen 50 years of, Oh, so you've seen 50 years of education so far. yeah. Right. <laughs> How do you think that that's, that's changed during these years? 
Uh, How do you well, think education, more, it, design it, it, education has changed? Yeah, it's certainly become more structured. From the 80s, the 90s was, was quite loose. You know, and when I became an external examiner at UCA, they did a training session. At lunch, we had a conversation. When did the relationship between students and tutors change? And someone suggested it was when full fees came in, when things were priced up yeah. and value for money. And so it wasn't that loose. Yeah. So in some ways, it needed to become a bit tighter. Um, there, there was certainly a need for improvement in structure. But in some ways, the structure of modules, units, courses, create these silos where things are locked down and, and there's not so much fluid, fluidity between tutors. So there might be a really good tutor doing great stuff on the GMD BA course that would work really well on yeah. the MA. The MA could probably benefit. Why can't we have this looser approach? So things became more structured and justified and legal through the, the handbook so that students could see what was being offered. You couldn't offer something that you couldn't deliver. So I think that sense of structure, um, administration, quality assurance, guidelines, uh, regulations. And in some ways, I don't think we can complain because we weren't self-regulating. There were things, you know, if one could self-regulate, uh, but in the big institutions, people were acting up. And, and I know because I was in a, a quality assurance position where you say, please, can we have your annual course monitor reports? We've got the border study tomorrow. There is a sequence of things. There is a structure we have to fit in. So I think things got tougher and, and stricter. And I, I think now um, staff are, are more professional. We had to get staff with their teaching qualifications. So, again, I was responsible for that transition. And people resisted it. Well, they would say, I went to the Royal College. Yeah, but 20 years ago, things have moved on. Um, and I'm great. I'm, I'm, I can judge everything. How do we know? You know, um, so we, we got more staff teaching qualified. But do you think, do you think a teaching qualification is relevant in design education or a teaching qualification has been designed for other subjects? Yeah, it makes you more, is relevant. Uh, it makes you more aware uh, because you do a little, an action research project. So you can take something from your practice. Of course. No, no, like, I, of course. I, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about because I did a, a large teaching qualification myself. Yeah. But, but do you think that's, that's. How relevant is that compared to, for example, somebody who is, uh, you know, a practicing designer or, you know, how does it work with, between somebody who is very aware of the theory and not so much aware of the practice? Yeah, um, I think graphic design education benefits from practitioners, um, but they're not really in the system. They don't necessarily understand the sensitivities that educators have to deal with. They might be, they might be judging it by commerce you know there, there's some really great companies and our the students from my course went to work at places like pentagram c design bibliotech uh maybe why not uh browns we seem to get on with them quite well yeah. but our course i worked as a graphic designer in a studio with my tutors so again that connection i could see the two sides coming together um so I do think that's important. Uh, the action research project was in, was the important part. Well, I didn't know about you know things like constructive alignment. You know, like you have learning outcomes, you have um, assessment yeah. criteria, you have the project in the middle, and you have the constructive alignment. I think possibly edu speak has got out of hand. When you're outside, you know, you're not using words like criticality and additionality. Um, and, but when you're inside, that's the language. And it can seem a little bit uh, off-putting, particularly if someone's coming to study for the first time at a university and they hear this, this language. So I think sometimes the language can become an, an issue. Sure, sure. But, but do you think the model we have here now benefits students more for, for to find work or, or, or doesn't benefit them? Um, well, I always... I see the the macro and I see the micro. Yeah. So as far as yeah. me in the situation, I always saw it as the connection between myself 
and the other individual that was going to be on the course and it, all the individuals. So I often maybe cut off from what was outside the room and the large, I had to deal with the larger picture, the macro. But when I was working with yeah. people, they, I, it wasn't geographically based. It was people based. It was me and the people in the room. And they could, sure. they could communicate back to me. There was an open discussion. Um, so I thought it was useful going through the teaching qualification because you could examine, like I could look at, if my, my course is, was international, most students hmm. came from, you know, I, we used to put a map on the wall to document where, to map where we all came from. And we literally came from Canada to Russia all the countries in between. And so we, we as the information yeah. part, we would document that. And most people were studying in English as a second language. Most people spoke between two to four languages. There was only ever one person on the course that only spoke one language, and that was me speaking English. So I didn't understand what it, what is it like to study visual communication in a second language. And also cultural variation mm -hmm. in an academic culture shock. When you're coming from a certain culture that doesn't question academia, you expect them to get that yeah. within within weeks. It, it, that's not going to happen. So that became my project was, yeah. um, you know, um, when we write project briefs in English, what's it like? And I used to see sometimes students would accidentally leave their printed project assignment and I saw they'd written Chinese over it so they began to interpret my or words like interrogate the question interrogate is a threatening word somewhere else in the world so we use a certain language mm -hmm. so that I was able to as part of the teaching qualification look at the language we use within the assignments or how we talk um verbally so i gained a little bit of an insight by by doing that it can seem a little bit no sure sure but i no this is fantastic mm. but what, how about sort of looking at this from a from a more of an overview you know in a sense that from 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 a more from from a more a higher viewpoint in a sense that 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 there's the culture we have now you know benefit because because yeah in my experience there's been a tremendous reduction Right in 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 uh, in everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I suppose one of the things which we don't do a lot is uh, is to talk to the student. What do they want? I mean, I know there's there's student surveys, but often they're they're written in a particular way, and it can be particularly if it's anonymous. It can be like an an Amazon review or a Trustpilot review. But when you talk, <laughs> you need to talk face to face, eyeball to eyeball with people, and say. Which coming back from say the pandemic, when they said like, why do you need to come back to college? What what projects, what workshops are essential to be in person? So I said to the students, what is worth dying for? So they actually told me, this project is essential uh, to to be together in a room, together. So it's quite surprising. Some of the workshops that we do, there's one where we get newsprint, we make a twelve page tabloid, and we within the morning, do a layout for the, you know, for a particular project that we were going to do later. And it was like half a day to do 12 pages on newsprint. And they said that was a really important yeah. in-person thing. Um, so again, I've been lucky with, with my course in that I can control the environment and I can control how I operate within that environment. And, sh and students can say whether they like it or not. As some don't, but I think mm. hopefully most do. Hopefully most people appreciate it. Um, so although one programme director had observed that it, we weren't cutting things back to the bone, we were cutting things back to the marrow, but I just kind of operated yeah. within... I operated within the room, the people, so I didn't really um, take that on board. I know there's been lots of you know strikes... Uh, I could see outside the college. Uh, so I know there's a, maybe unhappiness from the staff perspective. I suppose now being, I've been three years out of the system 
Um, I always just felt I will do whatever, whatever the structure is, whatever the validator course is, I will just I will do what I think is is right within that, and be judged and be judged on that. So I suppose I've always um, operated within you know within I looked at what's available, what's in the system, um, and and try yeah. to still stay true to what I think is is right. Um, but I don't want that to be necessarily. Um, my, people might think that, I, that I'm indoctrinating. I hope not. I hope that I've taken on board in the students, the people that I've worked with. I mean, some of them are like Henrietta Ross, Ian Carr, Camry, how are now course leaders. Kat Drew is senior um, design person at the Design Council. Margot Lombe set up her own company. Uh, I taught June Manyama Smithson when she was on the GMD. So a lot of people from 20 years ago are coming back to me. I, I'm saying, I hope I wasn't too harsh. And they said, no, no, we didn't say that with you. So it's really interesting to, to hear from people from 20 years ago. Um, like Jeff White, like Jeff White, I think he had the same attitude. Whatever's being cut around him, he would just come in and do his thing. And so I've got my greatest hits that I've developed over the years. So I went to work at a place down here when I left called the Margate School, which is an independent school operating outside an, of an old Woolworths building. So, again, I was able to go back and get a contrast yeah. with where I've come from is really big. And there's a momentum that it's sometimes like it's a bit like King Canoe trying to stop the tide coming in. You can't stop the tide. If it's moving in a direction, you have to decide, can I operate within that? Is there anything that I can change? Can I change? Or, or do you leave you know, if you can't? Which brings us to, 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 the, to the important question. If, if you had a magic wand, if there, was no limit, if there were no limitations at all, what would you change? Okay. Um, well, yeah, I was saying that, I mean, that's that. I suppose one could deal with provocations, and but I mean, the reality, as I said, was I feel a bit like um, King Canute sitting in his throne trying to stop the sea coming in. Um, yeah, that I was able to do what I wanted to do within um, the setup. I think possibly the language. I, I would try to make the language more accessible. You know. It feels a bit exclusive sometimes, and exclusive from the perspective of excluding, particularly if someone's coming for the first okay. time and is feeling nervous. I dealt with people, uh, like I dealt with a, a extreme distance runner who didn't do a degree because her profession was extreme distance running. But aged 40, she had to think about what next. And she was, she was very anxious about coming into the academic environment. So it can be very off-putting. So how do you make it? less off-putting and maybe the language like I, every year i would say it's a bit naughty i would say who's heard of the term learning outcome and no one ever put their hand up and they all had done an undergraduate degree and that's the big higher education picture is learning learning outcomes so but if you switch yeah. the language if you just say well what would you like the outcome of your learning to be it becomes more understandable. Yeah. And you say, well, I want to know something different that I don't know now, and I want to be able to do something different that I can't do now. L knowing and doing something different. So I understand to get a nice convenient term like learning outcomes and assessment criteria. Yeah. But I think people want to make nice things when they're on the course, and maybe they don't understand, and maybe they get so connected to the idea of grades and numbers and you Absolutely. know like, like when i did the teaching qualification i wasn't at that time someone else's distinction i was a pass and i accepted that and I accepted the the feedback so i think a great project would be um what feedback would student like particularly written feedback what is the most useful uh feedback that you can receive you know of oh, this the whole educational experience the the environment that you study in yeah how, do, is a blank white room the best environment to learn in or is it if you go to a design studio it doesn't look like 
an, a, a studio within education. And uh, one I saw did see in Bradford when I was an external examiner there many, many, many years ago. I liked the way they just in integrated everything. So they put books and magazines into the studio. Silk screen was there. Computers yeah. were there. And likewise, I, I was an external examiner with Paul Crawley at Canterbury College, and he had done the same sort of thing. There was um, the dirty environment and the clean environment were together, and there were posters. So you were learning. You had learning models surrounded, surrounding you, whereas yeah. a blank room might not be that inspiring. Um, so I think um, the environment, that kind of environment, language, how you communicate to people, uh, how you can affect change, what do they want? They, they want to sort of somehow improve, and how do you, how do you, you know, see that in a human um, way? And I, one thing that I learned. That I think it's really important within myself, within people, is developing judgment. You need the practicalities, the mechanics. But what is judgment? Um, I had one economic student that said, in maths, if you get 100 questions right, you get 100%. And she said, I noticed within art and design, that's not the same. There's this subjectivity aspect of it. So... But I think you, one has to accept that people are going to make a judgment on you, and it's not a judgment on you as a person. It's just something to give you the degree. So in judgment, in what I'm doing now, and creating audio motion pieces, and I'm on my own, I, I create lots of layers and tracks. Um, but at some point, you've got to say, is it too much? What do I turn off? And I, I think, but I work really hard on that bit there. Well, is that the metric? Because you've worked hard on something, it's taken a long time. Is that the thing you're judging? Or, or are you judging, does it work? And I learned that also from Brian Eno, who also like distracted, don't concentrate so hard on something. So he would make a loop yeah. and then go and get a book, sit down, and then gradually say, hold on, I think there's too many B notes. Take the B notes out. Yeah. So likewise with visual, I'm working with Apple Motion, not After Effects. So I'm just dragging on the effects. Oh, that's nice. I'll keep that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then you've got this layer of six things. And at some point, so is that bit necessary? You could just switch things on and off. And then you have to decide, use your judgment. You know, is this piece yeah, contributing? Absolutely. And maybe you have to reduce things. And I think that's what students have to learn as well, how to be independent. Absolutely. Could, yeah. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, mainly I'm putting stuff up on Instagram at the moment, really. I think uh, Twitter doesn't seem to be doing much. I just look just to keep aware of what's going on. Um, Facebook is more friends and family. There's LinkedIn. I haven't really been doing much there. I know some people prefer that as a platform. But mainly at the moment, I put stuff up on and I also try to write something. I don't just say, look at this lovely swirling mass. I try to yeah. reflect on what I've done, even if it seems sometimes illogical. I just say, this is how I've been thinking about this. So it, I'm thinking differently from when I was working in a studio with Peter Gill. Uh, it was, the company was called Route 2. In the end, we changed it to the, the name of the proportion is, is Route 2, like A4. Um, so there's an archive site. A route two isn't functioning anymore. I'm still in touch with Peter Gill. I'm still in touch. We're on a we're on a a continuum. I feel like Peter Gill came before me. I, I studied karate, and they got a, well, a, the teacher's called Sensei, which means the one who came before. So Peter came before me. Then there's me, and then there's people that come after me, and we're in that continuum, handing over the baton. And I feel that within the yeah, subject absolutely. and within education. So, yeah, I can be found mainly will be on Instagram, which I, I think I've sent you the link. Um, and I do, if you read, I do try to reflect within the limited number of words why I've done something. You know, it's, it's all, everything's ongoing. Just because I was a student once, I then became an educator. I'm now something different. But there's a, there's a, a, there's a thread that continues through that from the six-year-old to the 62-year-old, there's a thread. Um, but I'm really enjoying where I am at the moment, doing what I'm doing, 
you know, I've got currently doing something. We, we haven't mentioned the book which I'm doing with Ian McLaren, oh, which which is looking at. Let, let's let's of just, course. Just a quick one on that. It's still developing. So apart from I've left education at the moment. Maybe I'll go back sometime. Um, I, I'm doing more of my own work. I help support uh, um, Icebreaker during the pandemic. They were doing releases, monthly releases. So communicating with someone from a different subject, what what they think is important isn't what the graphic designer thinks important. The graphic designer might think a title mm -hmm. is important. I need to get hold of something. The title to a musician isn't that important. Or um, looping, they don't like looping. So James was creating the audio loop by, or he tried it once, I think, by splicing in the middle. So there's going to be le less audio difference. There's more audio difference from when it's the front and the back. But if you cut the tape in the middle and loop from the middle, you know, but online's different. So yeah, the, but the, the other thing that I'm doing, that I have been doing for quite a long time with Ian McLaren, who is best known for his work with the Munich 72 Olympics, although he's done loads of other things within education and uh, as a graphic designer. Um, I wrote something about the Munich 72 40th anniversary in 2012. And I, I hooked up with Ian, I interviewed him, I wrote a review, And then I invited him to do an interview about his time in education. In nine, he was a student in 1957 to 1960. So again, times were very different than initially at Back Hill before Elephant Castle. Um, so I interviewed him and that was interesting. And he was a bit nervous or lacking confidence about the post-war period. And he leant forward and he said, are people still interested in this? And I said, I think so, about the post-war period, the development of visual communication, graphic design from 1945 to 1980, essentially modernism within graphic design, yeah. within the schools, yeah. within the related profession. And there's some very interesting things that we found out um, how things were operating back then. So we've, we've written that into a book that talks about the austerity period, but was full of positive attitude towards the future and building towards that. We talked about the schools, how important, incredibly important the schools were then, central, um, the central LCP. Royal College initially was a bit old school, but had to radically change. Ravensbourne then suddenly came up during the 70s. Then we talked about key practitioners of that period uh, and their connections. So uh, obviously Ian McLean knows Ken Briggs and his work with the National Theatre. And the important thing is Ken Briggs worked directly with Laurence Olivier, the actor and who was director of, of that. And Peter Dixon worked directly with John Sainsbury at Sainsbury's. And this was a really important period of development. So we've put that into a book, um, We also bring it up to date. We ask people to reflect upon, um, you know, is, is, there, is there anything lasting from that? Or is it is it fashion? Is it a period in time? Or is there an attitude that, that irrespective of what the visual look of the 1950s were, is there an attitude that still pervades today? So that that's something that I've been working with Ian on as well as doing my, I hopefully in two, 2024 that becomes real. Uh, because it, it's been which part around. of 2024 i hope the first part the, but it's all, the beginning or the end i hope the first part or the middle no the first part, the first part. it's been going yeah. for so long that um i think ah. things i think things are in place you know it's written it is designed um we're having meetings you know at the moment so i hope that becomes a reality There might be things that people are disappointed with, but we can't write it from the perspective, apart from the final chapter, we have to write what happened in the 1940s and 1950s. You know, it does take on the picture of the emigres, emigres to this country, like Romick Marber, Henry and Germano Fischetti. So Germano and Romick were both in concentration camps in Germany. Right? Romick had a gun at his back, by the Gestapo. You can read about this on his website. website. Um, I think it's called No Return. He didn't want to write about his experiences in the concentration camp. Um, 
but he did. And Richard Hollis designed the book. Uh, and so that sense of modesty and humbleness from the older generation, hopefully that will come through. The reason why I'm writing the book is because in, in, a lot of people haven't heard. So you may have heard of something like David King. There's a book on David King. But not a lot has been written about that era within Britain. We know about continental Europe. We know about America. But we want to document that period. It can't cover everything. You know, life changes yeah. during the 1980s. So not everything is, is fully represented in the way that people would like from a 2023 perspective or 2024 perspective. Um, but it is all explained. The context, hopefully, is there. Um, so I, I hopefully that is an important piece of work. Um, yeah. That sounds really exciting. So do you have a title? It will be, well, we've moved, it, rather than calling it British Modernism, which locates it as um, uh, a nationality, it's Britain is at the end, yeah. so it locates it as a place it's in this country. So it's, it's modernist graphic design in Britain. And then from wow. 1945 to 1980, realistically, probably 1980, postmodern was in full throttle. Um, yeah. So, but it seemed to continue. People like, uh, well, I mentioned a few people like Lucy Roberts, uh, Bibliotech, C Design, North. And then, you know, um, yeah, various publishers are kind of quite interested in that that era as well. But it's become fashionable again. But I think what we want to do is to transcend that and talk about the attitude of those designers and and hopefully, you know, that young folk can pick up on that attitude of a positive optimism for the future, that they can they can design the future and, and it's the baton, the continuum hands over so they can do they can take the best of forward so they don't have to climb the mountain they you know people have done that and help them yeah. we can hand something over and that attitude of a positive optimism for the future you can make change i know there's a lot of depressing stuff around and people the agenda for young folk is so big and there's so many pressures to try and sort everything out but you can only do what you can do as an individual um, and I think to be humble in what you do, um, to remain self-critical, to, to question everything, question yourself, develop your judgment, learn from other people, be open to learning, but have your own voice um, and, and make your impact, whether within education or, or within the subject. You know, Ian McLaren said it for him, it happened. It was great. You know, and I can say the same. There are times where you feel it's not working, it is not happening, and you doubt yourself. But I, it came good for Ian, it came good for Peter Gill, it came good for me. There are ups and downs, but to try and stay positive, can do what? What, can you, what changes can you make? Like you know, David King obviously got involved in protest posters, things like that, things that he believed in. According to Judy Groves, he didn't go on the protest. He didn't go to the union meetings, but he contributed what he could to the to the areas that he felt strongly about. Um, so yeah, that's fantastic. Although you you have answered the question, but you could sort of, if you have something to add, what advice would you like to leave us with? Well, it's just okay. One thing that I didn't say there which I have do say to the students, uh, everything I said before holds true. But there's a danger if you see someone as uh, iconic or, you know, the, don't try to be me. I am the best me that there's ever going to be. If you try to be me, you'll be second best. You'll never be me. So having acquired everything, and it's great to take on influences and, emulate to learn but you have to be the best you you have to develop you you will be the best you that that has ever been so stay true to yourself you know learn as much as you can don't reject things you know you might things might not work for you at the end you might think well you know, i gave it a go but it, it's not really me um that's okay 
but just to try to stay open. But ultimately, you have to be who you are. And I have to accept that. I have to accept in all the things, karate, music, graphic design, I'm not going to be as good as some people, you know, um, but I have to be the best at, at my attitudes and what I can do myself. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say is you're in the continuum, pick up the baton, run with it, learn as much, don't cut off, but, but be the best you that you can be. That's absolutely brilliant. Tony, thank you so much. It's been okay. a wonderful conversation. No problem. And looking I, forward to seeing you soon. In Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. We didn't follow too much of a script. We kind of went a little bit. I uh, hope it makes sense. Oh, absolutely. It yeah. was great. Yeah, thanks.